The Pine Tree, based on a fairy tale by Hans Christian Andersen. How does a tree change as it grows? A young pine tree lived in a great forest near a clearing. He enjoyed watching the animals, feeling the morning sun on his branches, and resting in the cool afternoon shadows. The pine tree was very happy with his life. One day, a truck burst into the clearing. A logger cut down several of the enormous adult pine trees. Whack, whack, whack went his axe. Then the logger loaded up the trees and drove away. I wonder where my tree friends are going, thought the little pine tree. Then he spoke to three young sparrows sitting on a nearby branch. Would you please follow those big trees, he asked. I want to know what will happen to them. The sparrows shook their heads in agreement and flew away. The first sparrow followed one of the huge pine trees. She flew high above the tree as it rode on the truck. After a long trip, the truck finally stopped at a building near the ocean. For many weeks, the sparrow watched the tree. Busy workers used tools to cut and shape the tree into a mast. Then they attached the mast to a large sailboat. Two days later, the boat sailed out to sea. The sparrow quickly flew back to the forest to share her news with the little pine tree. The big pine is now the mast of a beautiful sailboat, she said. I watched it sail away this morning. That sounds amazing, said the little pine tree. I don't want to be small anymore. I want to grow up so the loggers will cut me down too. I want to be part of a sailboat. I want to have adventures on the ocean. The sparrow chirped back at the pine tree. I think you should be happy where you are, right here in the forest, she said. The second and third sparrows returned to the forest after a few months. They told the pine tree what they had seen. I followed two of the big trees to a factory and then to a house, said the second sparrow. The trees were used to make a wooden window seat. Every night I sat outside a family's home as a mother, a father, and two children sat on the seat and read stories together. Then the third sparrow chirped about what she had seen. I followed the rest of the trees, she said. I flew far away to a dusty lumber yard. I waited for a long time to see what would happen to the trees, but nothing did. The trees are still stacked up in a pile, and they are starting to rot away. The pine tree thought for a moment. I wish I could be made into a window seat. I would love to hear stories and children's laughter every night. But I imagine that lying in a pile in a lumber yard wouldn't be very fun. Better to stay where you are, said one sparrow. Three more years passed. The seasons came and went, and the young pine tree changed. It grew twice as tall as it was when the logger first came to the forest. It began to develop thick, brown cones and seeds. Even its needles became longer. Then, on a spring day, the three sparrows visited the pine tree. Do you still wish to be cut down? One of the sparrows asked. No, the pine tree replied. I am much wiser now. If I were to become a ship, I would miss the birds and the other animals here. If I were to become a window seat, I would miss the fresh air and sunshine. And if somebody were to dump me in a lumber yard, I would never again get to feel the soft ground around my roots. I'm content here in the forest. We are happy here too, said another sparrow. We have explored many places, but the forest will always be our home. Over the years, the little pine grew into a strong, tall tree, and the logger never came to the forest again. Farms Around the World What kinds of foods are grown on farms? The next time you eat corn on the cob, think about where the corn comes from. It probably comes from a farm in the United States. Maybe it comes from a farm near your home. A farm is a place where people grow certain foods. People all around the world work on farms. 
Everyone on a farm has a job. Some people plant and harvest the crops. Others might help raise animals. Farmers send their crops to stores all over the world. Then, people go into stores and buy them. Without farms, people wouldn't have foods such as corn, rice, or bananas. Farms are important for getting people the foods they enjoy and need. Do you like to eat potatoes? Potatoes are one of the most popular foods in the world. Farms in Idaho, Washington, and Colorado grow the most potatoes in the United States. Farmers plant potato parts in the ground to grow new potatoes. They plant them in the spring and then harvest the new potatoes in the fall. Potatoes grow just under the soil on long vines. After farmers dig up the potatoes, they ship them to stores. Some potato farmers grow potatoes that people buy in stores, fresh from the ground. Other farmers grow potatoes that are just for making french fries. While the potato is a very important food throughout the world, people also use it to make other products. Potatoes can be used to make a kind of fuel that people use to run cars and other machines. Rice is an important crop in China and in other countries in Asia. Did you know that rice is a kind of grass? Unlike potatoes, rice is usually grown in water. Farmers plant rice seeds beneath the dirt in a field, which they then cover with water. The rice needs the water to grow. After about four months, farmers are ready to harvest the rice. Harvesting has several steps, such as cutting the rice plant and threshing. To thresh a rice plant, the farmer may hit the plant against something hard until the part we eat falls off. Many farmers today use a machine to do this job, but some still do it by hand. After harvesting, farmers dry the rice and get it ready to ship to stores around the world. While people in Asia eat the most rice, people in countries like Brazil also eat a lot of rice. People in the United States eat less rice but they still buy a lot of rice from farmers in Asia. Bananas are a type of food that grow on trees. Unlike potatoes, which grow on vines, and rice, which grows on plants underwater, bananas grow above the ground on tall trees. Bananas grow in places with warm temperatures. Bananas need special conditions to grow. The dirt must be wet, but not too wet, and the land must be flat. The air must be warm because cold air could harm the banana plants. A banana actually begins as a tiny flower. When the fruit begins to grow, farmers cover it with a bag to protect it from the sun and bugs. After the banana is fully grown, farmers cut it from its stem and put it in water for cleaning. Farmers usually pack their bananas in crates or boxes. Often, the bananas are still green when they arrive at grocery stores. The delicious fruit is given time to ripen and turn yellow before people eat it. People use all parts of the banana plant for different things. Some people use the flowers for medicine, while others use banana leaves in cooking. A Tour of the Seasons What are the seasons and how are they different? The cold weather has come. A dry breeze shakes the bare branches. Snow is falling again, and the park is packed. Children ride down the hill on their sleds. A group of friends builds a snowman. There are only a few birds in the trees. Icicles hang from rooftops. Can you guess which of the seasons has arrived? The four seasons, winter, spring, summer, and autumn, are very different from one another. The weather gets warm or cool, rainy or dry. Animals and plants change and grow. People change their activities, their habits, and even the foods they eat. The seasons are not exactly the same in every part of the country, but their names are always the same. Every season brings some kind of change. It has been a long winter. One morning, you leave for school and notice that the air feels warmer. You see the green tips of leaves poking through the melting snow. 
Spring has arrived. In a few more weeks, animals start to return home. Squirrels chase each other across the yard. The trees grow brown and green buds. You spot a robin hopping along in search of worms. It can rain a lot during spring. The drops make plink plonk sounds on the roof and windows. Then the sun comes out, and you can finally go outside without a heavy jacket. At the park, the snow has given way to green fields and flowering trees. Spring sports have begun. Crack goes a player's bat as it hits a baseball. Families spread out picnics across the new grass. Spring is also the time for planting. People plant their gardens. Farmers plant seeds to grow vegetables, grains, and other crops. New life is all around. For many people, summer means fun. School ends and families spend their days outside. The hotter it gets, the more people want to spend time near the water. Beaches and swimming pools fill up, and boats dot lakes and oceans. Tents pop up at camping grounds, and you can smell delicious food cooking on grills. Every now and then, clouds roll in, thunder rumbles and crashes, and lightning shoots across the sky. Rain sends people running for cover, and then ends as suddenly as it began. Summer is also the season of insects. Flies, bees, and mosquitoes buzz back and forth. Crickets chirp throughout the evening, and active butterflies float from flower to flower. In many parts of the country, plants are growing lush and thick. Corn grows past our heads, and tomatoes ripen on the vine. It is a time for fresh vegetables, juicy slices of watermelon, and cool lemonade. Finally, we come to the fourth season, autumn. Have you ever picked apples at an orchard? Do you like the smell of pumpkin pie cooking in the oven? Have you ever jumped into a soft pile of leaves? These are some special things about autumn. In autumn, the weather can't make up its mind. Some days still feel like summer. On other days, we must bundle up in a warm sweater or a jacket. But the animals know exactly what to do. Most of the birds migrate to warmer places. The squirrels start searching for nuts to bury for the winter. The plants know what to do too. In many parts of the country, you can tell that it is autumn just by looking at the trees. Leaves turn from green to yellow, red, and orange. Then they fall off the trees and blow with the wind. In yards and parks, people rake the leaves together and leap into the piles. School starts again in autumn. We get ready for change. It's time to start the cycle of seasons all over again. The frog and the locust, based on a pueblo folktale. How do the animals who lived near the creek finally get a different kind of weather? Pakua was a little green frog. She lived next to a creek in the forest. One summer. There was a drought for many weeks. Everything was hot and dusty, even the trees. Without rain to keep it flowing, the creek was starting to dry up. It shrank into a row of muddy puddles. Many forest creatures left their homes to search for water, but Pakua stayed near her puddle. I feel too hot to do anything. Pakua moaned, "But I must get help from the rain god. If it doesn't rain soon, we will all be in trouble." So Pakua began to sing. As she croaked and bellowed, her throat grew round like a bubble. But her song was not loud enough. The rain god, high up in the sky, could not hear her. Mahu was a locust. He lived in the trees along the creek. One day, he heard a frog singing a song that he had never heard before. It was Pakua's rain song. Like Pakua, Mahu was lazy from the high temperature. He felt too tired to lift even a single wing. But he was curious about Pakua's song, so he flew to a branch that hung over her puddle. 
What are you doing, frog? asked Mahu. I am singing to the rain god, answered Pakwa. I am asking him to send us water from the sky. That is a very good idea, said Mahu. It is terribly hot and dry. If anyone can help us, the rain god can. Let me help. That would be wonderful, replied Pakwa. So Mahu began to sing too. He rubbed his wings and feet together and made a sound like a shaking rattle. But even together, the frog and locust songs were not loud enough to catch the attention of the rain god. Pakwa and Mahu's duet made such a loud noise that other animals started to hear them. At the next puddle, another frog and another locust decided to find out what was going on. One hopped and the other flew over to Pakwa and Mahu's puddle. What are you two doing? they asked. Pakwa and Mahu stopped their singing long enough to answer. We are singing to the rain god, responded Pakwa. We are asking him to send us water from the sky, added Mahu. Then they went back to singing. Now, isn't that a clever idea? said the other locust to the other frog. I predict that if we sing along, the rain god will hear the four of us. We are going to help you, the second frog said to Pakwa and Mahu. She and the locust returned to their puddle and started singing. Back at their own puddle, Pakwa and Mahu heard their song getting stronger. I hope this works, Pakwa thought. This might be our last chance for the rain god to hear our song. Still, there was no response from the rain god. But then something amazing happened. Pakwa and Mahu's song had reached every animal in the creek. Up and down the creek, more locusts and frogs heard the rain song and joined in. Puddle by puddle, one by one, they began to chirp, snap, rattle, and croak. Before long, the spirited song of hundreds of frogs and locusts filled the forest and traveled high up into the sky. Suddenly, the rain god woke up from his long nap. How can I get any sleep with that loud noise going on? he complained. Then the rain god looked down on his forest and its creatures. He saw the dusty trees, the dried-up creek, and the thirsty animals. And at once he knew that the song of the frogs and the locusts was a call for help. So the rain god gathered up his biggest rain clouds and went to work. Far below, Pakwa and Mahu saw the clouds gather overhead. They felt the first drops of water. And as the storm came and rain filled up the creek, they sang with joy. Rainbow Crow A Retelling of a Lenape Myth How Did the Animals Stay Safe in Bad Weather? A long time ago, Rainbow Crow played with his friends, Owl and Coyote, in the forest. Everything around them was warm and green. The friends enjoyed spending time together among the tall trees. I could stay in the forest forever. It is so wonderful to be here with all our friends, said Coyote. Crow flew to the nearest branch. His beautiful, colorful feathers shined in the sun. Yes, he sang. This is a lovely place to be. Suddenly, the clouds passed over the bright sun. The forest became dark and cold. Snow began to fall. Soon a thick blanket of snow and ice covered the beautiful trees and bushes. The animals did not know how to prepare for this kind of weather. They shivered in the freezing wind and became very scared. Owl spoke first. One of us must go and ask Sun for warmth to melt the ice and snow. Who will make the long journey? Coyote shook the snow from his tail before speaking. 
I would go, but Sun knows that I play tricks and will not trust me. Also, because I cannot fly, it would take many months for me to get there. Owl hooted in agreement. You are right, Coyote. You cannot go to Sun. I would make the journey, but I have trouble flying during the day. It would take me too long to fly to Sun if I only fly at night. Coyote and Owl looked at Rainbow Crow. Crow nodded his head. Then I will fly to Sun. I can fly quickly and over a long distance. While I am gone, you must teach the other animals how to be safe in this cold, snowy weather. Coyote and Owl agreed. Rainbow Crow perched on a big rock, ready to fly away. The animals gathered around him and wished him goodbye. Please be careful! Shouted Coyote as Rainbow Crow spread his wings and set off on his long journey. Rainbow Crow flew for three days. He flew through heavy snow, fog, and wind. Finally, he reached the fiery warmth of the sun. Crow begged Sun to melt the snow and ice. Please help us! Sang Crow to Sun. All the animals in the forest are so cold. All the trees and flowers and plants will freeze in the snow and ice. Sun thought for a long time. I cannot bring you my warmth, he finally said. Once the snow falls and ice forms, there is nothing I can do. But I can give you fire to melt the snow and ice from the earth. Sun found a stick. He lit one end of the stick on fire. Then he gave Crow the other end to hold in his beak. Hurry back to Earth with this stick, said Sun. This fire will be enough to save your friends and all other living things. Crow thanked Sun and turned around to begin his long journey back to Earth. But as Crow flew away, he flew too close to Sun, and his tail caught on fire. Rainbow Crow flew back as fast as he could. As he flew, the smoke from the fire covered his wings. Soon the rainbow colors turned black, like the color of thick smoke. But Rainbow Crow flew on. Finally, he landed on a big rock in the forest. As Rainbow Crow stuck the fiery stick in the ground, the ice and snow began to melt. The animals cheered in celebration. You did it! exclaimed Owl, who perched on a branch near Rainbow Crow. Thank you, dear friend, said Coyote. Rainbow Crow opened his beak to sing, but all he could say was, Caw! Caw! I have lost my singing voice, said Rainbow Crow sadly. As I flew away from the sun, my throat became clogged with smoke from the fiery stick. Now I cannot sing, and my feathers are as black as night. Do not be sad, Owl said gently. You saved us. We will always remember what you did. We will be proud of your bravery forever. No one will notice your black wings and hoarse voice. And so it was that the brave Rainbow Crow came to be honored by all living things. Baby Farm Animals How are some farm animals alike, and how are they different? A farm is a busy place. Not only does a farmer grow the crops, but a farmer also watches over the many animals that live there. You can see horses, cows, ducks, chickens, sheep, and pigs at a farm. All of these animals are alike because they live on a farm but they are also very different because none of them look or sound quite the same. Every year, new farm animals are born on a farm. Some are born on the floor of a barn, while others are born in a nest. After these baby farm animals are born, their mothers take care of them. They will make sure their babies get enough food, sleep, and exercise. Two baby farm animals are a foal and a calf. A foal is a baby horse. A calf is a baby cow. 
A foal and a calf are alike in some ways. They both stand on four legs, and they both have hooves. Both foals and calves like to stay near their mothers after they are born. But a foal and a calf are different in their appearance. A foal can have a plain brown or black coat, while a calf can be born with black and white spots. Foals and calves also make different sounds. A foal can make a sound like neigh, and a calf will make a mooing sound. Most foals are born at night. This helps protect the baby horse from other animals that could harm it. A foal can already stand up just one hour after it's born. The mother cow licks her baby all over after it is born. This not only cleans it like a bath would, but it also puts the mother's scent on her baby. From then on, the calf always knows his or her mother. The next time you visit a farm, look out for the chicks and ducklings. You will probably see them following their mother around the barn or near the pond, or you might hear them. Chicks or baby chickens will say "cheep cheep cheep." A duckling or baby duck makes a quacking sound. Chicks and ducklings both stand on two legs and are born with a soft, fluffy coat. Chicks and ducklings hatch from eggs laid by their mothers. As soon as they are born, they like to get warm by sitting close to their mothers' bodies. Chicks and ducklings have a lot of differences too. A chick will wander around on land, usually near the barn, while a duckling will spend its time floating in a pond. A chick is born with a beak. While a duckling has a bill, a chick is born with a tiny tooth in its beak. The chick uses the tooth to break the shell and peck its way out. When a duckling is born, it is very thirsty. It needs plenty of water to help it grow. Lambs and piglets are common farm animals. A lamb is a baby sheep, and a piglet is a baby pig. If you go near the barn, you may hear the ba of a lamb. Or a piglet's high squeal. Lambs and piglets are alike in some ways. They both stand on four legs and drink their mother's milk after they are born. Their mother's milk is the only kind of food they will eat for many weeks. Lambs and piglets stay with their mothers after birth. This behavior helps protect the baby animals from harm. Lambs and piglets have many differences too. A lamb is born with a soft, fluffy coat, while a piglet is born with smooth skin. Piglets usually live inside the barn when they are young. Lambs will stay outside. Piglets are very hungry when they are born. You may see piglets climbing all over their mother. They are trying to get as much milk as they can. A lamb spends a lot of time with its mother. If a lamb and its mother are separated. The lamb will recognize its mother by the sound the mother makes. Every baby animal needs its mother. The family pet. What makes these families choose to take care of different kinds of pets? Imagine adding someone new to your family. What a change that would be! How would you adjust? What would you think about? Choosing a family pet takes careful thought. This animal will share your home for many years. Your pet should fit your lifestyle, how you live from day to day. Any kind of pet, from a fish to a cat, will depend on you for all of its basic needs. Every member of your family must agree to take this responsibility. You are about to meet three families. Each family chose a different pet. And took on a different amount of responsibility, and each family had its own reasons for choosing the right pet for their lifestyle. Now it is time to meet the Park family. Let's learn about their lifestyle. This will help you understand this family's choice of a pet. The Parks live in a small apartment in a city. They like their home, but they sometimes wish they had more space. The park children want to get an indoor pet because they do not have any outdoor space, such as a yard or a porch. Mr. and Mrs. Park asked their children to think about the cost of a pet too. They do not want to spend a lot of money on food, 
equipment, and care from a veterinarian or pet doctor. The park parents are also very busy. They are willing to get a pet, but the children will have to take care of it by themselves. The park family decided to get some fish. They bought three goldfish and a small tank. The worker at the pet store taught the children how to keep the tank clean and how to feed the fish. Caring for three goldfish takes up very little time and space. Compared to many other pets, fish require little responsibility. Let's meet our second family, the Dasons. This family lives in a house outside of a city. The Dasons are active people who like to be outside, but they are not home very much. This means that they are too busy to walk a dog or play with a cat every day. Still, the family would like an entertaining pet to enjoy. After visiting a bird breeder, the Dason family bought one male parakeet. Back at home, Mr. and Mrs. Dason help their children as they learn to care for their bird. Each day, they must change the parakeet's food and water and tidy up the cage. Then, every two weeks, the cage and bird toys need a thorough cleaning. The children take turns doing this task. It's often time to play. Parakeets are fun pets that like to be held. The family has learned that they can train their parakeet to talk. The key is to speak clearly and slowly and to repeat the same words. If the Dasons are patient, their bird will start to mimic or copy the words they say. The Dasons, our bird family, chose a medium responsibility pet. Our last family, the Johnsons, spent a long time planning for a pet. Each family member promised to give plenty of time and attention to an animal. The Johnsons live in the country. They have a lot of space inside and outside, and they love to spend time outdoors. Mr. and Mrs. Johnson also have enough money to spend on food, toys, pet equipment, and veterinarian visits. The Johnsons want a social animal. They like to cuddle and play with a pet. They would also like to spend time training an animal. The Johnson family decided to adopt a golden retriever puppy. Before they picked up their dog, they set up a weekly schedule for feeding, cleaning, and walking the dog. Then they chose a name, Logan. The Johnsons were ready for a high-responsibility pet. Still, they did not realize just how much time and love Logan would need. Mrs. Johnson and her daughter stayed up all night with the puppy for the first week. Everyone finally settled into a routine. Like the Parks and the Dasons, the Johnson family knew that they made the right choice for their family pet. Anansi, an African tale. Where do Anansi and the turtle live? It was an average morning in the African desert. No wind was blowing. The sun was just warming up, and the birds were chirping and searching for food in the branches of the baobab trees. Anansi the spider lived in this desert habitat, at the bottom of a twisty baobab tree. She caught beetles and moths and flies and butterflies in her web. She was cooking up yesterday's catch, fried bugs with beetle sauce. Anansi was humming and cooking when her friend Turtle walked by. He stopped at the welcoming smell of food. May I share your breakfast, Anansi? he asked. Certainly, Turtle, Anansi answered after a long pause. But, if you please, wash your hands first. Turtle frowned, but he agreed to go wash his hands. This is the driest part of the desert, he thought as he walked away. I don't want to complain, but the nearest water is all the way back at the river. As Turtle walked to the river, he watched out for wild animals that might eat him, like eagles and baboons. It was a dangerous trip. Finally, Turtle reached Anansi's house. Anansi was sitting back in her chair looking very satisfied. 
Then Turtle saw that half of the food was gone. Anansi looked at Turtle closely. Your hands are still dirty, she said. I want to share my breakfast with you, but you must wash your hands again. So Turtle returned to the river and washed his hands again. On the way back, he tried his best to keep them from getting dusty. Back at Anansi's house, Turtle found that all of the food was gone. I was going to save some food for you, said Anansi. But then I decided that you would not want to eat cold insects. Next time. Turtle knew that Anansi had tricked him, but he said nothing. He simply went home hungry. A few weeks later, it was another hot day in the desert. All of the desert animals were cooling off near the river. Dragonflies buzzed above the water. Birds waded in the water searching for fish. A family of elephants took a loud bath and sprayed each other with their trunks. The river was Turtle's home. He had spent the morning fishing for minnows. Anansi crawled to the river's edge just as Turtle was sitting down to lunch. She could see him at his table under the cool, clear water. Anansi poked her head into the river. Hello, Turtle. May I join you for lunch? she asked. Why, of course, Turtle replied. It would be my honor. Come on down. Anansi dived into the water, but she floated right back up to the top. She was too light to stay down at the table. Keep trying, Turtle called. He watched happily as he took a giant bite of snails. Anansi kept trying hard to sink, but it was useless. Anansi watched Turtle eat his delicious lunch, but she could not reach him. She became upset. Then the stubborn spider came up with a clever plan. She filled her jacket pockets with heavy river rocks. The extra weight helped her sink to the river bottom. Anansi pulled up a chair at Turtle's table, picked up a fork, and reached for a bite of snails. Just one minute, my friend, said Turtle. Anansi stopped. What seems to be the problem, Turtle? she asked. Well, at my house it is not polite to eat with a jacket on. Please take off your jacket, Turtle said. Anansi knew that she could not be rude in her friend's house. She took off her jacket and floated back up to the surface of the water. Her plan had failed. All she could do was crawl home hungry. Turtle tricked me right back, Anansi thought as she fixed her web. I guess I deserved it. Later that afternoon, Turtle visited the Baobab. He apologized to Anansi, and she apologized too. The two friends promised to share their food from then on. The King of the Winds Retelling of the Odyssey, Book 10 What can help Odysseus go from here to there? Once upon a time, a man named Odysseus traveled the world on a great adventure. He and his men sailed the seas in a grand ship. One day, Odysseus and his men sailed to an island. The island was ruled by Aeolus, the king of the winds. Aeolus proudly welcomed Odysseus and his men. You are welcome here, my brave travelers. Please stay in my city. So Odysseus and his men stayed on the island. He told Aeolus, the king of the winds, about his long journey on the ocean. Eventually, Odysseus was ready to return home. I have been away from my family for a long time, he told the king of the winds. To help Odysseus get home, the king of the winds decided to give Odysseus a wonderful gift. The king of the winds handed Odysseus a plain bag. Odysseus watched as the king of the winds filled the bag with many stormy and noisy winds. He used his great strength to tie the top tightly with a string so none of the bad winds could escape. 
I have put all of the bad winds into this bag, said the king of the winds. Now they will not bother you on your way home. Good luck on your long journey. Thank you, said Odysseus as he took the bag. Since our transportation is a sailing ship, it will be much easier to travel without terrible winds blowing us in different directions. So Odysseus went back to the ship. His men prepared the ship to sail away from the island. Everyone on the island waved goodbye to Odysseus. Then the king of the winds used a good wind to blow Odysseus and his ship toward home. Odysseus and his men sailed for nine days. The gentle winds helped to push their sea vehicle slowly and safely across the water. On the tenth day, Odysseus could see land from the ship. Soon they would be home with their families. We are almost home at last, he told his men. Our ship should reach land soon. Since Odysseus was tired from the long journey, he decided to take a short nap. But his men were not so sleepy. They looked curiously at the big bag that Odysseus had carried onto the ship. I want to see what is in the bag, said one sailor. I bet it's filled with gold and silver. We should have some of that treasure for ourselves. Then one of the men ripped open the bag. Odysseus heard a loud noise and quickly woke up. He saw the opened bag and the sailor staring at the angry winds rushing out of it. Oh, no, shouted Odysseus as he jumped up and grabbed the bag. But it was too late. The stormy winds had already escaped from the bag. They swirled around the ship and flew into the sky. Soon there was a terrible storm. The fierce storm lasted for a very long time. As the storm raged, the ship changed course and sailed away from Odysseus's home. We are moving back toward the island of the King of the Winds, cried Odysseus as he stared at the rolling waves. After sailing on the wide sea for many days, Odysseus and his men gradually reached the island. Odysseus told the King of the Winds what had happened, and he begged him for help. But the King of the Winds would not help Odysseus. I will not help you this time. You must get home on your own he said. Odysseus and his men had no choice. Once again, they left the island. But this time, they had no good winds to carry their ship, and it would take them much longer to get home. The sailors realized that what they did was wrong. They were truly sorry that their curiosity to see what was in the bag caused such trouble. They learned an important lesson, and Odysseus and his men finally made it home after all. The Best of the West What do you know about the American West? The American West is a special place to visit in our country. It has exciting cities, high mountains, and amazing wildlife. Let's take a tour of four famous spots in the West. Do you know the word for a crack deep in the ground with a river at the bottom? It's called a canyon. The Grand Canyon is a huge canyon in Arizona. Many people visit this national park each year. Visitors can enjoy the view or hike down the canyon. Some people raft on the Colorado River and look at wildlife. One animal is the California condor, the largest flying bird in North America. If you hike the canyon, be careful of the weather. It might be cold at the top, but the temperature at the bottom can be 100 degrees. Where in the West can you see bison, moose, and grizzly bears? And where can you see a natural fountain that sprays water more than 100 feet in the air? These are in Yellowstone National Park. Yellowstone was the very first national park in the United States. It is an amazing place to explore. Under the ground of Yellowstone is hot, liquid rock. Yellowstone is covered with spots where hot water, mud, and steam push up from underground. These areas are called hot springs. Pools of hot water bubble up from underground. Yellowstone also has hundreds of geysers, more than any other place on Earth. 
Geysers are like hot springs that erupt with steam and water. The old faithful geyser erupts about twenty times each day. It sprays water high into the air. Have you ever heard the word safari? On a safari, you travel through the land and look at animals. Yellowstone is a great place in the United States to go on safari. As you drive through the park, you will see bison, bears, moose, and elk up close. If you're lucky, you may even spot a wolf or a bald eagle. Now we will travel north to the city of Seattle, Washington. From different spots in the city, you can see a strange white building poking into the sky like a giant needle. This is the Seattle Space Needle. The Space Needle is 605 feet tall, which is taller than most buildings. It looks like an object from outer space. You might wonder at the purpose of this building. It was built for the 1962 World's Fair, an important event that happened in Seattle. The fair's planners wanted to build something new and different. They wanted people to say wow when they saw the building. The Space Needle is made out of concrete. To make the underground base or its foundation, 467 cement trucks poured concrete for an entire day. Now let's head to the top of the needle. A quick ride in the elevators will get you there in less than a minute. At the top, you can see the entire city of Seattle. You can also see natural sites such as Lake Washington and Mount Rainier. Finally, you can eat at the moving restaurant. It moves slowly in a circle to show people the whole view of the city. The final stop on our tour is a famous bridge in the state of California. Can you guess what it is? Here's a hint. It is bright orange. It's the Golden Gate Bridge. When it first opened, it was the longest bridge in the world, almost one mile. The Golden Gate Bridge is the boat entrance to San Francisco Bay from the Pacific Ocean. For cars, walkers, and bicyclists, the bridge is a way to connect the city of San Francisco with other places in California. Many people cross the bridge to get to and from work every day. The first thing you might notice about the Golden Gate Bridge is its color. The color is called International Orange. The orange color was chosen to fit in with the bay's natural beauty. Some people wanted to use different colors. For instance, the U.S. Navy wanted the bridge to be black and yellow so that it would stand out. What do you think of the orange color? Since it was built, the Golden Gate Bridge has been closed only three times. People built the bridge to last a very long time. This incredible bridge turned 75 years old in 2012. A view from the moon. What do you see on the moon? All around our planet, people can look up at the sky and see the moon. This glowing ball has always been mysterious. But in 1969, two astronauts traveled far into space and walked on the moon. This helped us solve some of the moon's mysteries. Here on Earth, we see the moon at night and sometimes during the day. It can look like a round ball, half of a circle, or a thin slice. It is hard to tell how big the moon really is. That's because the distance between Earth and the moon is so great. The moon looks smaller than a cloud because clouds are closer to us than the moon. And the moon looks bigger than a star because the stars are much farther away. What is it like up there on the moon? People asked. The only way to answer this question was to build a spaceship, land it on the moon, and then travel back to Earth. The mission that did this was called Apollo 2. 
the lucky astronauts were Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins. The astronauts flew two different spaceships to the moon. The main ship, named Columbia, took them to just above the moon and then back to Earth. The actual moon lander was named Eagle. The astronauts trained hard. They studied every part of the ships to prepare for the strange world of space. They also got used to their heavy spacesuits. These suits would protect them from very cold and very hot temperatures on the moon. After liftoff on July 16, 1969, it took the astronauts three days to get to the moon. Living on a spaceship was a challenge. There was very little room to move around. The astronauts ate special dried or liquid food. They had to make sure all the tools and instruments were working properly. But it would all be worth it. On July 20th, the Eagle landed on the surface of the moon. Neil Armstrong had the honor of taking the first step. Then the astronauts explored the amazing new land. The astronauts collected moon rocks, took pictures, and planted an American flag. They also practiced walking in their spacesuits. Walking on the moon is fun because people weigh less there. When you jump up, it takes a while to come back down. The surface of the moon is covered in powdery dust. Like the planet Earth, the moon has different land features. It has mountains, flat parts, and even fields of hot, bubbling liquid called lava. Eagle landed in a smooth area called the Sea of Tranquility. But even the moon's smooth areas have lots of rocky holes called craters. The moon is not nearly as colorful as planet Earth, though. From close up, astronauts on the moon only see gray colors. There is no water there. Seas on the moon are not real seas that have water and waves. And there is absolutely no wind there. If you go to the moon today, you will still see the footprints of every astronaut who walked there. We are all used to seeing Earth from up close, right under our feet. But what does Earth look like from far away? Neil, Buzz, and Michael got to do something very special. They got to see planet Earth from way out in space. On the surface of the moon, it is very dark. There is no blue sky. The colorful stars shine even brighter. The moon under your feet looks big, and Earth looks very small. Earth is called the blue planet because most of it is covered in ocean. From space, it is easy to see the blue color on Earth. If you look closer at Earth, you recognize the brown shapes of Earth's lands. Rainforests are bright green and deserts are yellow. White clouds swirl above the land. Looking at Earth from the moon, Earth looks too small to stand on. You have to remind yourself of all the people who live down there. We have answered many questions about the moon, but there is still a lot to learn. The moon is a fascinating place we can hope to return to one day. Helping out at home. How can families help out at home? Home is a very special place. We go there to rest, to play, and to spend time with our families. Home is a place where we feel safe and sound. But it takes more than a home to keep a family happy, healthy, and safe. It takes cooperation and hard work. Each member of the family, from young children to adults, can help out by doing chores. A chore is a job, such as cleaning your room or feeding a pet. Chores can happen inside, outside, or even across town. Chores can even be fun, especially when the whole family does them together. 
An hour of folding laundry can turn into a time for telling stories, laughing, and listening to music. That doesn't sound like work, does it? Helping out at home sometimes means taking care of other people in your family. Do you have an older family member, such as a grandfather or an aunt, who lives in your home or in your neighborhood? It can be difficult for some older people to move around. They might have a hard time doing their own chores. Family members like you can bring them food, go for walks with them, keep them company, and help them around the house. You might also help out a family member who has a disability or an injury. Some children read stories to their brother who is blind, or they carry groceries for their mom who has a sore arm. These are important ways to contribute love and support to your family. Another family chore is babysitting. Do you have older brothers, sisters, aunts, or uncles who take care of you or who take you to fun places? Or do you help take care of a baby in your family? Sometimes parents want to spend time together or with their friends. Babysitting helps them to do that. The kitchen is often the busiest room in many homes. It is a place where family members make meals, eat, clean up, and then do the same routine again. You have probably noticed that people do a lot of chores in the kitchen. First, it takes work to organize a kitchen. This chore usually happens after a trip to the grocery store. Your mom or dad might ask you to put the food in a cabinet or refrigerator. This keeps the food neat and easy to find. Next, many children help their parents or older siblings prepare meals. They wash vegetables, stir ingredients in a bowl, make sandwiches, or set the table. Some meals, like holiday dinners, take all day to prepare. After you finish your meal, there are more chores to do. Now it's time to clear the table, wash and put away the dishes, and wipe the counters. People spend a lot of time doing kitchen chores, so many families make the kitchen the nicest, coziest room of their home. Roll up your sleeves and pitch in. Of all the family chores, chores that we do outdoors are often the most fun. These chores change with the seasons. In the fall, leaves need to be raked into piles in the yard. In the winter, family members work together to shovel snow off of the driveway and sidewalks or to put up holiday decorations. In the spring and summer, families care for their gardens and yards. Some outside chores happen all year long. Children can help take out the trash and recycle, pick up the mail, fill bird feeders, and sweep up the porch or patio. The next time you go outside, take a look around your home. Is anything out of place? Does your yard or porch need cleaning or decoration? If the answer is yes, ask your family how you can help. Outdoor chores help keep us healthy, too. We move our bodies, breathe fresh air, spend time with the whole family, and even meet our neighbors. We can accomplish chores faster and have more fun when we help each other. Whenever we do chores, our homes become happier places for everyone. Teddy's Week Teddy's mama says Monday is washing day. Teddy helps Mama sort socks. Sometimes Teddy is buried in socks. Teddy likes Mondays. On Tuesday, Teddy's dad comes home early. He says Tuesday is his work-at-home day. Teddy helps Daddy clean up the yard. Sometimes Teddy is buried in leaves. Teddy likes Tuesdays. Teddy's brother and sister say that Wednesday is family game night. Teddy helps pick out the game. Teddy helps them count when they move their markers. 
Teddy likes Wednesdays. Thursday is shopping day. Sometimes Mama does the shopping. Sometimes Daddy does it. But Teddy always goes along to help. He picks out cereal and his favorite cheese. Teddy likes Thursdays. Friday night is family movie night. Teddy helps Mama choose a movie at the library. Daddy fixes supper. When everyone gets home, it's time for dinner and a movie. Teddy likes Fridays. Actually, Teddy likes the whole week. The Little Red Hen. Are pig, cat, and duck good citizens? Once upon a time, Little Red Hen lived on a farm with her friends, pig, cat, and duck. Little Red Hen worked hard. She kept their house tidy and did the chores. However, her friends were very lazy. They wanted to rest while Little Red Hen did all the work. One day, Little Red Hen found a grain of wheat. She excitedly ran to tell her friends. She wanted to be a good citizen by including her friends in her plan to plant the grain. Who will help me plant this grain of wheat? she asked. Not I, said Pig. I am busy rolling in the mud. Not I, said Cat. I am getting ready to take a nap. Not I, said Duck. I'd rather float in the pond. Fine, said Little Red Hen as she turned away. I'll plant it myself. All summer, the wheat grew and grew. Little Red Hen took care of the wheat every day. She watered the stalks and pulled out the weeds. The wheat grew tall and strong. Soon it was necessary to cut down the tall stalks. Then Little Red Hen would bring the wheat to the miller to grind into flour. One morning, Little Red Hen approached her friends who were enjoying the beautiful sunshine. Who will help me cut the wheat? she asked Pig, Cat, and Duck. I will also need help carrying the wheat to the mill. Not I, said Pig. I want to cool off in the mud. Not I, said Cat. I am still tired today. Not I, said Duck. I promised my friends I would go to the pond with them. Fine, said Little Red Hen. I'll cut the stalks and bring them to the mill myself. So she cut the stalks, packed them, and carried them to the mill at the end of the road. Soon the miller had sent the freshly ground flour to Little Red Hen. Little Red Hen was eager to start making bread. The soft, fresh flour smelled delicious. She couldn't wait to get started. Little Red Hen called to her friends, who were spending the afternoon outside. Who would like to help me make bread from the flour in this bag? she asked Pig, Cat, and Duck. But Little Red Hen's animal friends were not interested in helping her. Again, they sat lounging in the hot sun. Not I, said Pig. I am too busy baking in the sun. Not I, said Cat. I need my rest today. Not I, said Duck. I was just getting ready for another swim in the pond. Little Red Hen sighed. Fine, I'll make the bread by myself. So she hauled the sack of flour into the kitchen and began gathering the ingredients she would need to make the bread. Later in the afternoon, the scent of freshly baked bread floated out the kitchen window and drifted across the farmyard. Pig, cat, and duck smelled the delicious bread and wandered to the farmhouse. When they looked in the kitchen window, they saw Little Red Hen sitting at the table. She was going to eat the bread without them. Ah, who will help me eat this bread? asked Little Red Hen when she noticed her friends at the window. I will, said Pig, licking his lips. I will, 
said Cat, staring hungrily at the bread. I will, said Duck, smiling at Little Red Hen. But Little Red Hen shook her head. No, you may not have any bread. I did all the work. I planted the grain, cut the wheat, took it to the miller, and made the bread. Since you did not respect all of the hard work I did to make this bread, you may not have any. So Little Red Hen ate all the bread herself. Spider Woman Teaches the Navajo A Navajo Tale How did Spider Woman teach the girl that things in nature can be used to make new things? One day long ago, a young girl walked to Spider Rock. Many people told a legend that Spider Woman lived nearby. Suddenly, the girl heard a soft voice calling. She looked all around, but she did not see anyone. Then the soft voice called again. It seemed to be coming from inside the earth. When the girl looked down, she saw the ground had split open. There was a tiny crack in the earth. She was curious, so she peeked into the crack. Below the crack, the girl saw a small room. There were rugs hanging on all the walls. The rugs were woven with wonderful bright colors and had beautiful designs. What beautiful rugs! exclaimed the girl as she looked down into the room. Spider Woman looked up at the girl. Come in, child, she said. Suddenly, the girl found herself in Spider Woman's room. Can I learn to weave rugs like these? asked the girl. Will you teach me how to create them? I will teach you to create rugs if you agree to just one thing, said Spider Woman. You must go out into the world and teach Navajo women how to weave. I will, agreed the girl. So Spider Woman began the first lesson right away. The girl listened closely. First, the girl learned that the materials for the rugs were natural resources. The colors come from the earth, explained Spider Woman. White comes from shells, and blue comes from turquoise, and many more colors can be made from plants. Spider Woman taught the girl how to make each beautiful color. Next, the girl learned about the loom, which is a weaving machine. My husband, Spider-Man made this loom for me, said Spider-Woman. The bar across the top stands for the sky, and the bottom bar stands for the earth. My loom is made of the sun's rays, the lightning, and the rain. Spider-Woman taught the girl how to use the loom. Finally, the girl learned about the designs. The designs come from the earth and the sky, explained Spider-Woman. When I weave, I think about the clouds. I remember the flash of lightning when it rains. I dream of sunbeams on sunny days. And I remember the beauty of the mountains standing against the sky. Spider Woman continued with a warning. You must never draw your design on paper, she said. Close your eyes and imagine the design in your mind. Let the weaving come from your heart. Spider Woman taught the girl how to make the designs and the girl promised to listen to her heart. The girl was almost ready to begin weaving, but first, Spider Woman shared one last piece of knowledge. The edge of the rug must have one small break in its design, she said. It can be as simple as a light color woven into a dark background. This opening is called the energy pathway. It is how the energy of the weaver escapes from the rug. If you do not leave the opening, your energy will be trapped inside the rug. You will not be able to create any more beautiful rugs. So the girl began to weave. She wove rugs and blankets with lovely colors and designs. After a lot of hard work, she became a very good weaver. Then she left Spider Woman. She kept her promise to teach Navajo women to weave. The girl became known as Weaving Woman. For the rest of her life, she traveled and taught the Navajo women to weave. And that's why, to this day, the Navajo still weave their beautiful rugs and blankets 
for all people to enjoy. The Elves and the Shoemakers, based on a tale by the Grimm brothers. What can happen when the elves work together? Once upon a time, there lived two shoemakers, a man and his wife. They worked in a small shoe shop where they made and repaired shoes. Like others in their neighborhood, the shoemakers were honest and hardworking, but poor. One fall day, the shoemakers had only a few bits and pieces of shoe leather left, and no money to buy other supplies. I still have hammers and nails, but there is hardly enough leather to make another pair of shoes," said the shoemaker sadly. "And there is no food left for dinner," added his wife. That evening, the shoemakers left the scraps of leather on the work table and went to bed hungry. They would decide what to do tomorrow. The next morning, the shoemakers went into their shop. "Goodness gracious!" they both exclaimed. They could not believe their eyes, for there, next to the needles and thread, sat a perfect pair of shoes made from the scraps of leather. "What beautiful shoes! Such excellent work!" said the shoemaker. "Who could have done this job for us?" His wife took the shoes outside the shop to marvel at them in the daylight. Just then, one of the king's men walked by. "What beautiful shoes! Such excellent work!" said the king's man. "I must buy them," and he gave the shoemakers a gold coin. With the money, the happy shoemakers were able to invite their hungry neighbors to a celebration. Off they went to the market to buy food, and with the money they had left, they bought enough leather for two pairs of shoes. That night, the neighbors came over for a simple but delicious meal. Later, the shoemakers cut out more leather with large scissors. They left it on the workbench to work on the next day. Then they went to bed. While the shoemakers slept, two tiny elves scurried in. They busily snipped and stitched with strong needles and thick thread. Then they shined their two perfect pairs of shoes with a rag. They left the shoes on the workbench, and in a flash, they were gone. The next morning, the shoemakers went to their work table. Goodness! They cried. There on the workbench sat two beautiful pairs of shoes. The shoemakers put the shoes in the shop window. Just then, two of the queen's ladies in waiting walked by. What beautiful shoes! In our opinion, this is the most excellent work we have ever seen. Such precise stitching! They said. The queen's ladies gave the shoemakers three gold coins. The grateful shoemakers took the money and bought even more leather. Who is making such beautiful shoes for us? The shoemaker wondered as he cut up the leather. We must find out who is helping us. Tonight, let us stay up and watch," said his wife. That night, they did not go to sleep. They hid behind the door of their workshop and waited quietly. The shoemaker stayed awake, watching the shop. At the stroke of midnight, two elves in old, worn clothing suddenly appeared. The elves hurried to the workbench, grabbed the pieces of shoe leather, and in no time at all, made four beautiful pairs of shoes. The shoemakers were amazed. "Did you notice the holes in their ragged clothes?" said the wife. "They have done so much for us. Perhaps we can do something for them." The next day, while the husband sold the four new pairs of shoes, his wife made new clothes for the elves. That night, instead of more leather, the shoemakers left the clothes and a note on the work table. The note said, "Dear elves, thank you for helping us." They signed it, "The Shoemakers." At the stroke of midnight, the two raggedy elves appeared. They read the note and joyfully put on their new clothes. They danced, sang, and laughed with glee, and then they skipped out the door. The elves never came back, but the grateful shoemakers had enough money to continue making shoes and to live a happy life.
The perfect color. What can happen when artists think about things in a new way? Close your eyes and imagine a sunset. What colors do you see? You might see orange, yellow, and pink. You might also see a color that is hard to name. Is it purple? Is it blue? Or is it somewhere in between? This purplish, bluish color is brand new. You have invented it. And if you wanted to see the sunset that you imagined, you would need to make this perfect color. Artists are creative people. They like to imagine common things in new ways. Painters make brand new colors to match a sunset, a leaf, or a lion's eye. Someday you might see a painting of a pink elephant instead of a gray one. This painter was having fun with color. How many colors are there in the world? Twenty? Four hundred? Actually, the number of colors is endless. This is why anyone can invent a new color. To learn about how to make colors, let's talk about something called a color wheel. A color wheel is a circle filled with shades of color. The most important colors are called primary colors. The three primary colors are yellow, blue, and red. You can make any color in the world by mixing the three primary colors plus black and white. For example, if you mix yellow and blue, you make green. If you mix yellow and red, you make orange. And if you mix blue and red, you make purple. Now, what if you want to make a color like red just a bit lighter? You would mix in some white. And what if you wanted to create dark blue? You guessed it. You would mix in some before artists begin to paint, many of them sort their colors. This helps them get organized so they can find colors easily. There are many different ways to sort colors. For example, all of the shades of the color red might go in one group, such as orange red, brick red, cherry red, and sunset red. Another group might include all the blues. Colors called midnight blue, sky blue, and ocean blue. Artists use lots of different tools to mix new colors and then paint with them. Something called a palette is a flat surface that holds blobs of paint. An easel holds up the piece of paper or canvas that the painting goes on. A paint knife is a flat metal tool without a sharp blade. Artists use a paint knife for mixing and painting. Artists paint with brushes of many shapes and sizes. Sponges are great for blending paints. Painters like to get creative with their tools, too. Now it's your turn. Do you remember that perfect sunset color that your imagination showed you? It's time to share your color with the world. The best way to make a perfect color is to experiment. Get your colors and tools together, sort them, and play. Painting is fun. First, try putting different amounts of color together. You might want to use more blue, less red, or just a little white or black. Here is a new question. How mixed up do you want the colors to be? If you stir them a lot, you will get one solid color. But if you mix them just a little, you will see swirly lines of each color. When it is time to do the painting, play with your tools. Try using different sizes and shapes of brushes. If you have finger paints, smear the paint on with your fingers and hands. You could even try scraping away some of the paint after it is already on the paper. At the end, you will get something that is one of a kind a perfect color, and a creative work of art.
Protect the environment. What ideas do these children have to protect the environment? Take a breath of fresh air. Sip some clean water. Go for a walk at your local park. Air, water, and parks are parts of our environment. We need a healthy environment to survive and to enjoy life. Sometimes, people hurt the environment, but you can help to protect the environment every day. Some places do not have enough clean water. That is why we must not waste water. Take short showers or shallow baths. Turn off the faucet while you brush your teeth. Collect rainwater in a bucket and use it for your house plants. Using cars can pollute the air. To keep the air clean, use cars less. Instead, ride your bike, walk, take the bus, or share a car with others. Another way to protect the air is to plant trees. Trees take away some dirty air and make clean air. Every new tree adds clean air to the environment. Now, let's talk about garbage. We need to keep our environment clean and free of trash and litter. When it comes to garbage, follow the three R's. Reduce, reuse, and recycle. When you reduce, you buy fewer new things and make less trash in the world. Sharing is one way to reduce. When you share a book or a game, you do not have to buy new ones. If you fill a reusable water bottle with tap water, you do not need to buy plastic water bottles every time you are thirsty. Reusing means using the same thing many times. This helps you make less trash. For example, take the same cloth bags to the grocery store every time you shop. That way, you will not have any plastic bags to throw away. Writing on both sides of your notebook paper is another way to reuse. Recycling is the last of the three R's. Lots of trash is recyclable, so it should go in a recycling bin instead of the garbage can. Some examples of recyclable trash are soft drink cans, cardboard, paper, glass jars, plastic bottles, and yard waste such as grass and leaves. Today, we are lucky to have electric lights, battery-powered games, and machines that wash our clothes. But all of these objects use energy, and using too much energy can hurt the environment. Also, there are limits to how much energy we can use. That is why we always must use energy wisely. There are many ways to save energy or to use less of it in the first place. Turn off lights that you are not using. Ask your parents to buy special light bulbs called CFLs because they use less energy. Unplug computers and televisions when you go on vacation. Also, you can save a lot of energy if you hang your clothes to dry outside instead of using an electric dryer. Heat and air conditioning are major energy users. If your heat is on, make sure all the doors and windows are closed. When the weather is warm, open some windows instead of turning on the air conditioning. Or even better, ride bikes to the park with your family and swim in a cool lake. Humans have the power to change the environment of all animals and plants. Every year, many types of living things die because of human activities. For instance, we sometimes destroy the homes of animals to make room for buildings or roads. Or we dump trash in rivers and the fish and plants die. You can help protect land. If you have a yard, help your parents make a compost pile. This is a place where you can throw away food waste, such as banana peels and potato peelings. Over time, your food scraps turn into healthy soil. Helping plant trees or a garden is a way to make the land healthier. Gardens also save energy. If people grow their own food, then trucks do not need to transport food from far away. To help wildlife, Learn more about animals and how they live. 
go to parks, wildlife preserves, and other places where you can appreciate nature. At a national park, you can join a kid ranger program and help keep the land safe and clean for animals. Next, encourage your friends and family to help protect the land in your community. It all starts with you. Thank <laughs> you.